Well, let's connect this into the present day. Um, and one thing that is um, a constant reoccurring theme is the reptilians or an extraterrestrial race interbreeding with humanity and creating particular bloodlines. And you've got an amazing um, ar artifact, I guess that's the word, uh, necklace here, which I know is incredibly heavy, which um, has a very significant contribution to make to this theme of extraterrestrials or another race, not human, interbreeding with humanity. Now, first of all, wh where did this come from? Say, so, we don't know. This necklace has been around for so long that we don't exactly know from which tribe it came. All I can tell you is that this necklace was in existence when the king who founded the Zulu nation, Zulu, was still a boy. It is described in ancient legends centering around this king. It is called Ingweba Yezimfilo, the necklace of the mysteries. It is really a book which tells 12 different stories. And how old do you think it is? How, long do you, how old do you know this document? I don't know, sir. All I do know is that... Hundreds of years? Or? Yes, yes, very old. But it's not as old as the green face that I've just shown you. Oh, the Chita face. The Chita face is said to be over 7,000 years old, this thing here. Now, this necklace enshrines several mysteries in it. Inside here are stones which are not from this earth. It is a very amazing story. There are three pebbles in here, which stories say were brought to this earth by an alien baby, which played with a human baby in the Northern Transvaal. This... First of all, that, that looks so much, just well, it's, it obviously looks very much like a, like a, a spacecraft. A a a yes. Yeah. This, this, half-molten object here used to be a serpent-like necklace worn by a Mashona chief. He went to investigate something which had landed in the bush and which was killing his people. And he went with his battle axe to attack this object. And the object blew a jet of very terrible fire at the chief. And he, he became just smoke. And this was all that was left of him. Now, this necklace enshrines one of the oldest and the greatest mysteries in our country. That the, the god beings which we call by the name Chidauri and which are called Zishwezi or Imanugela in the languages of other tribes throughout Africa. These gods came down to the earth in great uh, 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 vessels made out of gold and they united with female human beings to create a race of kings and queens on our earth. There isn't a tribe, Mr. Ike, anywhere in Africa. And when you return to South Africa, I will ask you to investigate this very closely. There isn't a tribe anywhere 
in Southern, Central, Western and Eastern Africa, which doesn't claim that kingship was a system that was brought down from the sky by gods who either traveled in swings, as the pygmies of Zaire say, or who came down in huge vessels which were shaped like bows, vessels made of gold, vessels bigger than mountains. I wish to share these things with you, say, as briefly as I can. The Zulu people believed that they originated from space, and their name Zulu does not mean sky, but rather interplanetary space. And the word Zulu also has to do with traveling. For example, if I say to a child, you are uh, getting about, you are moving from village to village lazily, I say, we are Zula, Wena. Now, the word Zula, which is used to refer to Zulus, sometimes contemptuously, in Zula, means really a traveler, a voyager, somebody moving from place to place. Where? In the Izu. Now, I ask you, how did a land-bound people like the Zulus know that you could travel in space? We are Zula, a Zuluini. You can travel in the great place of traveling. For that matter, Zulu people knew that the earth was a sphere and that it was the sun that was still in space and the various planets orbited around it. I will show you on the other necklace of knowledge. And when a Zulu refers to the earth, he says, umhlaba jigelele. Now, the word jigelele implies a spherical or a hemispherical object. But a Musutu or a Mutswana from Lesotho or from Botswana will refer to the world as Lifatsi, which means that which is down here. And he will say, when he refers to the Earth's shape, Lifatsi Ka Bupara. Now this word Ka Bupara means the Earth in its width. Thus, a Musutu or a Mutswana believes that the earth is flat, but the Zulus believe it is either a hemisphere or a sphere. The Zulu people were the first people to know something that is now attributed to Albert Einstein, namely that space and time are one and the same thing. Zulus knew that long before Einstein was born. They said that one other Zulu name for space is Umkati, Umkati, U-M-K-H-A-T-H-I, Umkati. And they called time Isi Kati. So you can see say, that Zulus, supposedly a nation of skin-wearing primitives, were aware of the fact that space and time are one and the same thing. And further, that if you could find the river of time, you could travel into the future and into the past. And many are the ancient legends which are told in Zululand of a man who traveled to through time 
and accidentally killed a young boy who turned out to be himself in the past, and so he no longer existed anymore. There's an indication on the necklace, uh, I know, uh, around the back that the earth is round. One of the symbols is indicating that, or a sphere. Yes. But I, I wonder what you um, think, uh, Credo, of what is taught to children and students all over the world in the universities and the fancy academic centers that actually we are now at the cutting edge of human evolution in terms of technological knowledge and knowledge of the world and the universe. And in fact, um, back in the um, ancient world in Africa and North Africa and all over South America, they were just a primitive people. Please say, that is a lot of poppycock. In fact, in my long investigation into our past, I can tell you proudly that our ancestors were 20 times cleverer than we are. What I feel and what I think say, is that in the past, human beings were cleverer than we are today. And that human beings knew more than we know now. We are not progressing, Mr. I. We are simply rediscovering things that were known by better men and better women than we are thousands of years ago. I wish to offer you proof of this, some of it at least. Say, there are things that I have found in my travel through the world, things that prove to me that our ancestors were highly advanced in chemistry. Our ancestors had become so clever that they could, they could take science and reduce it to such a simple level that they were able to help hundreds of starving human beings after some traumatic happening in the past. Let's um, concentrate on some of the images on the yes. necklace and the symbols, because that leaves no doubt that a lot of knowledge has been around for a very much longer time than, than yes. we are ever told. First of all, on the hand, I'm seeing uh, the eye. Now, the all-seeing eye and the, uh, the symbol of the eye is one the Illuminati use all the time. And, and it's one, of course, that was a very big symbol of ancient Egypt, the Eye of Ra and what have you. Why is that eye there on that hand? That represents the terrible eye of the Chitawuli, the eye which sees everything, the eye which knows everything. It is said that when a Chitawuli dies, he passes his dead eye onto his next of kin. And to the Chitauli, an eye is a very, very powerful symbol. This is the eye of the Chitauli. And, but there is more to this thing. So here there is a hole that goes right through the copper. Now, if you put water in that hole, you end up with a a, a simple magnifying microscope and you can see gems through that water. The magnification is amazing. The, the great symbol is pointed out again and again um, on the dollar bill, which is on the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States, yes. put on there by the Illuminati, a president called Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, is the all-seeing eye. Um, and so is it your understanding that the all-seeing eye, when it's used by the Illuminati, represents this third eye of the Chetahuli. Yes, I do. I really am sure of this. Why? Because in Africa, even ordinary human eyes are regarded as a very powerful devices of magic. If an African shows you respect, he mustn't stare at you but he must stay at a point beyond one of your shoulders. Now, we call this Klo 
klonipa, which means deny me your eyes. We believe that when emotionally roused, an ordinary human being can inflict great damage on another human being by the f unseen fires that emanate from one's eyes. We believe that we, a, a, a Zulu warrior must never allow his dying enemy to look at him. For example, when a Zulu was killing an enemy, he used to cover that enemy's face with his shield to prevent the enemy looking upon him with his eyes and putting a curse upon him. It's interesting, people um, who experienced uh, the Chittahuli, the reptilians, um, in relationship to the British royal family and others at various rituals have said that um, at the point of sacrifice, the point of death in the sacrifice, that these reptilians stare into the eyes of the person dying, which would kind of fit why those, those warriors were very concerned about that. Yes, sir. What are they doing then? We have got a ritual, sir, which covers many fields, a ritual which is called Ugutata Umoya, taking away the soul where when a king is dying and he is fighting to pass on his knowledge and his courage to his successor, he would demand that the successor should stare heavily into the dying king's eyes. And also, when a creature is being sacrificed in Africa, whether it's a human being or an animal, that creature must be stared at by the sacrificer so that its spiritual characteristics are drunk in by the one sacrificing it. I, I, I have seen many times uh, on hunting expeditions in Kenya, Tanzania, and other parts of Africa, when a lion is just about to breathe its last, the hunter, one of the hunters, will stare into the lion's eyes until the lion's eyes start glazing in death. It is drinking in the soul. We believe sir, that the eyes are not just for seeing, that they are for taking as well. Now, on the hand uh, here is what looks like the symbol of the constellation of Orion. Um, what's the significance of that? Say, people throughout Africa believe that the original human beings either came from Orion or the gods for whom read the Chitauli and many other alien nasties actually come from that constellation. We call it the constellation of Umhambi, the one who travels very, very far away. And we call this constellation also the constellation of Matsieng, the giant who was sent by God to this earth to create uh, 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 the first human beings. Matsieng was accompanied by a male lion with a very black mane. And he was also accompanied by his dog. And he traveled throughout the world he first created the first race of human beings, and he was, they were so stupid in appearance that he buried them alive in, the cave, in a cave. And then he created the next race of human beings, we, who, which was clever, and the, we are the descendants of that race.
also on the um, hand is the, what we would call today the Star of David, which of course is not actually a Jewish symbol. It started being used uh, quite relatively recently uh, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, but it's actually a symbol that's been found all over the ancient world. What's the significance of that being on the hand? I say, there are several interpretations of this very powerful uh, 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 magical symbol. We say that there are actually two universes living side by side. A female universe, which is our universe, and a male universe. And to Sanusis, these two triangles, a triangle facing downwards, represents the descending female principle and a triangle going upwards represents the rising male principle. It is a symbol of the unity of the feminine and the masculine. It is in fact the symbol, a very important symbol of duality. Is this the kind of um shape of spacecraft, etc., or flying craft that um, the uh, beings from other planets were no, supposed sir. to have flown in or not? No. This, you see, sir, there are various shapes. There are spacecrafts which are shaped like boomerangs or bows. Mm -hmm. These are very, very, very big. Then there are spacecraft which are shaped like pipes like huge pipes roughly pointed at either end. And out of those huge pipes come these little things here. Yeah. They are carried inside these huge pipes. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Now, um, if we could talk about this fella. Um, yes, first sir. of all, um, the, the, the penis and all this stuff, th that relates, uh, I would have thought, to the, the penis of Osiris uh, in Egyptian legend and, and the same recurring theme. Um, would that be uh, along the right lines? We say, say that King Samahong, who is represented here, yeah. the lord of all the Chitauri, call them what you will, had his penis cut off by Prince Muari, an African hero, and he replaced it with a golden one. Originally, we are told, this thing was made of gold. And now each time when we recall the story of the great marriage between human women and Chitauri men, we unite. These creatures, symbolical. And sometimes when the necklace is lying on the ground, we, we make a bed out of animal skin for these two figures, and then we lay them side by side and cover them with a, a small skin. So um, why um, are the depictions of the gods um, if they were reptilian, why are they not constantly reptilian? Why are they symbolized in other forms? Because uh, it is very, very, very forbidden to portray a Chitauli as it really is. Only in that large green head do we see a Chitauli represented more or less as it is. So this was dictated by the Chittahuli from yes, the start, was it? Yes. All along. It was, you are not allowed to represent the sons of the python as they really are. Then you are really in trouble. If you want to talk about the Chittahuli, you must either play with shadows, you must place an image of a Chittahuli against a light, and project its shadow onto the wall. So, so you've got a fish, I know, um, um, on the necklace as well, and fish, yes. fish are scaled. 
Is this anything to do with the symbolic representation of the Chittahuli in, yes, in, a, in a way that they couldn't do it openly? Yes, sir. They also, there is a particular Chittahuli who is called Wawane by our people. Wawane was one of the few good Chittahuli because there are also some good people amongst them. Mm -hmm. And Wawane had a brother called Mpangu. According to one of the great stories, they erupted a terrible war on the Red World where human beings had originally been created. And this war was between men and women. Sir. Yes. Sir. And in this world, men and women nearly decimated each other. But they were rescued by the Earth Mother who sent a great Nganyamba, that is, a great dragon, to come out of the sky to take them into its stomach and to bring them down to, not to our Earth, to a beautiful watery world near the, the star of the red dog, Injebovu which the white people call Serenus, the star of anger. There, human beings were settled, but human beings started eating creatures which they found in the sea, which they thought were fishes, but which were really human beings. Human beings, we are told, started eating the Chitawuli who lived in the sea according to one story. And the Chitauli fought back against human beings. They attacked them with tornadoes. They attacked them with, with tidal waves. And the human race was nearly wiped out. And then two brothers, two Chitauli youths, Mpangu and Wawan, took pity upon the human race. And they went into the sky and looked for a great egg. And they hollowed out this egg, emptied its contents out, and brought the egg to that world and loaded the surviving human beings and brought them to our world here. We say, say that Wawane gave us the power of kingship. He brought it out of the sky. And if you notice, in many parts of Africa, ancient kings used to wear a wooden helmet with golden horns. It was true in West Africa, and it was true also in Southern Africa in the great Munumutapa Empire. The horns representing the, the Chittahuli. Yes, sir, the power of the Chittahuli. Because to a Chittahuli, horns are not just for goring other Chittahuli as oxen go each other. No, horns are a symbol of status. And through its horns, a Chittahuli is able to communicate with human beings far across the, the, the face of the earth. So the horns were like antennae then? Yes, they were instruments of projecting power. In fact, it is said by storytellers that King Samahongo punishes those Chitauli who show mercy to human beings by pointing at them so that both their horns fall off their heads. And the Chitauri is therefore unable to, to, to direct human affairs through his or her horns. It's also interesting that you know, the, the descriptions of the Chitahuli um, with the, the horns and the, sometimes the tail and stuff, it's very, very close to how uh, 
Christians and uh, those sort of stories have depicted the devil. Yes, sir. And one thing that interests me is this, that depictions of the devil have, have subtly changed over the centuries. But there is a difference now. First, originally, the devil was depicted as a hook, hook-nosed creature, like a caricature of a North African moor. That was at the time when the Europeans were fighting the Moors as well as the Arabs during the Crusades. Many depictions of the devil then show the devil as having a hooked nose. And then later, somewhere in the 19th century early, the devil was depicted as an African with a snub nose, thick lips, and very dark skin. But what amazes me is that now, more than ever before, the devil is represented as a chitaudi. What, what concerns me, sir, is this, that these alien creatures are now about to reveal themselves and they are making us aware of how they look like. If you look, for example, at, at uh, bioscope films which were made in the 1950s, the 30s, and, and so on, depictions of space aliens of that time are ridiculous, very laughable, but not anymore, sir. Today, we are having films that depict the gray aliens exactly as they really are and the Chitauli exactly as they really are. My question is why? Are we being prepared for a major event? And let me share this with you. The group of American people who came to visit me a week or so ago and who left a rather unveiled threat about me shutting up or else my wife will die, who warned me about a certain creature called Eleazar or Melchizedek, that this creature is watching me, these people say, said this, that on Lake Titicaca there is a hidden beam of light coming from the sky onto the surface of that South American lake. And that on the 9th of September 1999, something very interesting is going to happen at Titicac. Now, I'm interested to know what this is. Well, I know from my own travels to that area that um, there are endless sightings of uh, craft and, and beings in that area. I've been there twice myself. And I, I, I do think, from again, from my own research, Credo, that um, we are being prepared for these uh, beings to openly um, be seen. And being prepared this way, sir, we, when we do see the, the nasties, we are not going to react to them with the fear that we would otherwise have reacted. Mm -hmm. Because now what, what game is someone playing? I think, sir, that they are playing the game that whoever they are, that we should accept these beings and welcome them with open arms mm -hmm. and make them our masters? I guess again. You see, sir, there has been a steady build-up in books, in children's comics, and in other things 
of the fact that we must accept these creatures. It started with the, with the film E.T., where a cute little alien creature got lost on Earth and fought hard to be accepted by human beings. I think the same thing is on the cards here. The question is why? The one other thing I would just like to raise before we move into the, the, the bloodlines and their yes. connection to the Illuminati is one thing that keeps coming up in, in my work is that some of these um, Chittahuli, these reptilians, um, at a high level of their hierarchy are actually white. Have you come across that? Yes. They are not white like white people. If you take if you take white cardboard and you soak it in dirty water, that is the color you will get. That is the color of the cheetah wool. And wait, sir, let us think carefully about this. According to African storytellers, the cheetah wool have got cold blood. They feel cold very quickly. And where they dwell, under the earth where the great sun god banished them. They dwell there surrounded by great fires because their blood is cold. They freeze eternally. And so if you come across them in, cave, in their caves, there are many, many cooking fires lit there. That's interesting, with the symbolism of the devil mm -hmm. being in the fires of hell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there is another thing. The, the, the Chitauli, they, their eyes, terrible as they are, are so efficient that if a Chitauli appears suddenly into the hot African sunlight, two things happen to him. His skin dries and blisters, and he goes totally blind. In fact, sir, there have been a strange race of aliens which have been seen in Africa, even by white people which I think are actually cheetah wooly. When you, the, you run and the thing chases you, it stops immediately when a car's headlights hit it and it becomes blind. Another thing, sir, we are told amongst our people that a sangoma must always have a bogo. This is a sharpened wooden stick which he or she must carry at night. We are told that a sharpened stick is the only weapon by which you can kill a chitaul. Well, of course, again and again as you speak, uh, what comes to mind is the story of Dracula. Count Dracula, the stake in the heart, the blood drinker, the, the blood drinking, uh, which is precisely uh, what this uh, Chittahuli and their crossbreed seem to be into. But sir, it is not just any wood that you must use against a Chittahuli. We believe that Rhodesian teak, a wood which has got a strange bitter taste, is the one type of wood that is poisonous to the chitaul. And down there, you see a long stick that I am carving in preparation for the year 2000. I might not be alive to see the year 2012, but this stick, which I've been working upon for the last five years, is going to be the one stick which my successor will carry, and it will end in a sharp point. This, this wood, rotation tick, is the 
wood that we say can actually kill a chitauli. And where the chitauli are found, you find Rhodesian teak or any other teak trees either being felled in large quantities or being pushed over by elephants. May I point out to you, sir, that many of the trees that are being destroyed in the Amazon jungle and in the southeast Af East southeastern Asian jungles, as well as in the African jungles, are teak. The one wood that the cheetah would fear. And while on the subject of wood, the only mask that can protect you against a cheetah is a mask made of teak. And in some of the flea markets, around Johannesburg, I'm seeing more and more masks carved in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe, representing a chitaul. The eyes are huge, round, with slits through which a person can see, and the lips are non-existent, and so is the nose. I've seen hundreds of such masks being sold by curious sellers in the streets. What, one of the other things that comes up in terms of the way they look is, is the domed head. Now, I was in yes. Egypt um, recently and uh, saw uh, depictions of Nefertiti and uh, the Akhenaten um, family, and they had big domed heads. Um, is this uh, a connection? Yes. Yes, sir. You see, <coughs> We human beings tend to imitate those creatures that we call gods. It's going on even now. When African women saw white people, they named them Abelu, which literally means the gods. And today, in America and in Africa, black women and some black men are going out of their way to give themselves hair which is European and not African in character. Now this thing say, was, was, it dates back thousands of years. First of all, the, the one race of the Chitauri the ones that are called Nomo or Nomo in, by the Dogoni people are depicted say, as having beard-like growths of the same type that look like the beards of Egyptian pharaohs. They are shown having, it is said say, that when a Chitauri gets very old, after tens of thousands of years, he, he or she develops a bone-like growth under the chin which twists around like the horn of that kind of fish-like creature I saw in Europe in a picture called a narwhal. And this thing curls up this way. Now, Egyptian pharaohs used to wear beards like that. Mm -hmm. And some African kings wore beards like that, real beards or even false beards made out of ivory or out of the tusk of a white hog. And the, there, is a, there was a time definitely in history sir, when African kings as well as Egyptian pharaohs went out of their way to imitate the appearance of the Chitaur. Queens like Nefertiti had their fa faces misrepresented by the court painters. They looked exactly like the Chitauri as, they, as near as possible. The high cheekbones the drooping chin, 
the unusually large head. African Sangomas, African Inyangas, ancient Egyptian pharaohs, all of them used to wear headdresses that made their heads look much larger than they actually were. If you look say, at the crown, certain crowns worn by Egyptian kings, the whole head, the crown, is intended to be an extension of the pharaoh's head to give the pharaoh an appearance of above average uh, intelligence. In Africa, we had kings who favored headdresses made out of the scrotums of elephants or, or rhinoceroses or even buffaloes. A scrotum which was dried and made bulbous and worn on the head by the king to make his head look larger than it was. And lastly, in ancient Greece, at the time when Greece reached the, high, the great heights in its culture and civilization, the great ruler Pericles used to wear a special soldier's helmet with a bulbous skull, a helmet which made his head look much bigger than it really was. Do and they still do that today? Do they, do, are there still African traditions that do that Yes, today? yes, sir. yes, very much so. And in America, some Native American shamans used to wear a special head made out of this, the head and the horns of a buffalo, which also made the, 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 the man's head look bigger than it is. Say, popes, the pope in Rome, wears a head which is intended to show him as having a brain bigger than average. That crown which has got one three crowns, one on top of the other one. And now, bishops, especially in the Greek Orthodox Church, they wear crowns like that. And the Tsar of Russia, one of the Tsars, wore a bulbous crown which was in two sections, which made his head bigger than it really was. And in Persia in Iran, some ayatollahs wear a turban which, whose effect is to make the man's head look bigger than it is, so does a Sikh. And so, for that matter, do the ancient priests of Israel, they also wore an onion-shaped uh, headdress. Whose, whose impression was to give him a far and above size head. But, but aren't there also um, traditions in which they um, manipulate children's heads as they're growing to, so yeah. that they become more yeah. human-like? Yeah. During my travels, travels in Africa, say, I came across an amazing people whom you must visit. They are called the Mangbetu people, and they live near Lake Rudolph in Central Africa. They are a beautiful, aristocratic people. And what they don't know about the universe is just not worth knowing. The Mangbetu people believe that an elongated skull with a flattened forehead pleases the gods. They, they, they flatten the skulls of their children, causing constant headaches to the child, even when the child has grown into adulthood. And I asked a, a beautiful Mangbetu woman, Madam, why do you torture your children this way? The woman, the wife of a senior chief, said to me, look, the gods 
want us to be like this. The story that you're telling, Credo, from the African perspective, is it, in effect, the same story as told in the um, tens of thousands of uh, clay tablets uh, found in what we now call Iraq, that have become known as the Sumerian tablets, that talk about a race of gods called the Anunnaki, who um, came in and brought knowledge, ruled the people, and interbred with them. Yes. Do you say, therefore, that the Anunnaki in those uh, stories that have increasingly, of course, been translated in a number of books, they were reptilian, you say? You say, all I do know is this, that here in South Africa, amongst the Tosa people, amongst the Zulu people, there are beings who are very revered even now, and they are called Amanuna or Amanono. Amanono is Zulu, Amanuna is Kozo. Now, these beings are godlike beings, we are told. They can change their faces. They can change their appearance. They can show you. Yes, sir. They are shape shifters. A manuna, a man now if if a Kosa man has married a very beautiful wife, a wife whose face seems to change every day, he teases that wife by calling her his Inuna. In other words, a shape shifter. Say, it is said that the, the people who are closest to the hearts of the Manuna gods are women. And why? Because the women give to the Manuna the power of, they worship the Manuna, they hero worship them, which explains why Nefertiti wanted herself to look like one of them, and her children too. She was actually hero worshiping these creatures. And the, 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 how you say, women say, are copycats, and I'm not being sexist when I say this, women will copycat any being that they think is supreme. In Egypt also, um, you have the, the python-like headdresses, which are, are pretty obvious when you look at them, that the pharaohs were um, connected with. Yes, sir. And the reptile has played an unusually strange uh, part in the culture of all African tribes. For example, it is my suspicion that we black people of Southern Africa are going to be deprived of our nationhood in the very near future, and that we are going to be ruled by people of Uganda. But wait, what is the real meaning of the word Baganda? Baganda. And what is the creature that you see depicted in, on the walls of houses and on the roofs of houses of some of the greatest empires in Africa? It is the python. There was a golden python which was used as a decoration on the roof of the, of the house in which the king of Benin, the Oba, lived. Zulu people revere the Mamba, a very terrible snake. Zulu people revere other snakes as well. And in a vendor in the northern Transvaal, the, the vendor people 
regard to the snake as well as the crocodile as sacred. And they, even today, their girls dance at initiation, a, a, a long, rather sinuous dance representing the movements of a python. And they call that dance the Domba dance. And Domba is the ancient name for a female python. Well, wherever you look, all over the world, whether it's the mire of Central America, you look at South America, Africa, anywhere, the, the symbolism of the snake, the crocodile, the representation of the reptilian is there. You go into Europe, and the Illuminati created uh, cathedrals like Notre Dame in Paris. You've got the stately homes of the aristocracy, etc., uh, with the gargoyles, the reptilian figures. It's been in our face, but we just somehow have had a blind spot to see it. We human beings have idolized the reptile since the very supposed birth of our history. Go even further, said, much further. What was the creature which was honored by the ancient Greeks in their Delphic oracle? The python. What is the creature that stands next to the figures of the goddess Athena, the python. No matter where you look, go to China, where I once went. Who are the principal characters who brought wisdom to, to humankind? Creatures, part snake and part human being, one of whom I remember correctly, was called Nu, a, a word which occurs also in Africa. And her brother was Kua, Kua. And sometimes it's turned into one creature, Nu Kua, she. Every way we, we human beings has, have sacrificed our dignity as a species and attributed great intellect and great glory to reptiles, tortoises, turtles, s lizards, snakes. Why? And even now, say, our fascination with the reptile and the amphibian has not stopped. In fact, it's growing. The popularity of all those dinosaurs in cartoon as well as in serious form, it makes me uneasy. If we could just pick up this line of, of bloodlines, which the Sumerian tablets talk about, which you talk about, the interbreeding of humanity and the, how the accounts explain that these crossbreeds were put into the positions of royal ruling power, almost as like demigods, um, middlemen between the gods, the Chittahuli, the reptiles, and the people. Um, those bloodlines, in my own research, um, became the European royal families and aristocracy, and today are the ruling, banking, business, and political and royal lines of the world. Um, and the genealogy supports this increasingly. Is there a tradition also that the royal lines of Africa go back to the same source? Please, you don't have to believe me. Go to Rwanda and there talk to the people there. They will tell you that they, the founding ancestors of their dynasties, the first kings who came from the sky and they were called Imanugela, the ascending ones, say, Many, many, many African tribes believe that when the gods came down from the sky, they found human beings very, very stupid. And the human beings could not come before the gods in order to be taught. So what the gods did, and this is a story that you also find amongst the Dogoni people in West Africa. 
because the, the, the human beings were afraid of approaching the, these reptile gods, the reptile gods cold-bloodedly slaughtered one of their number and shed out its flesh with a specially gathered crowd of human beings. And these human beings then became the ancestors of our first great kings. Now say, African kings jealously guarded their blood. If the royal lines of Africa claim descendants from the same source, basically, have those lines interbred as obsessively as the European aristocracy and royal family and not bred outside of those lines? Yes, sir. Royalty had to marry royalty. That was one of the strictest laws in ancient times. Which is obviously where we get the, the term the divine right of kings from. It's not actually God, it's actually the gods. Yes, sir, yes, yes. Royalty intermarried with royalty. You, could, you were not allowed to take a commoner as your senior wife if you were a king. You could take commoners after your senior wife. Yeah. That would mean that the genetics has been achieved. Yes, sir. Now, another thing, it is like the Sangomas. Very, very strictly speaking, a Sangoma who was sometimes viewed as a king or a queen, was not allowed to marry outside her caste or his caste. Sangoma had to marry Sangoma, otherwise the non-Sangoma blood would pollute the god blood inside the Sangoma. The um, lady that I quoted in my books, uh, Kathy O'Brien, who wrote her own book, Transformation of America, about being a mind-controlled slave of the American elite. Um, she talks in there about seeing George Bush um, as president and vice president shapeshift into a reptile. And, and so many other people have told me this story of world leaders today uh, changing into reptiles in front of their eyes and then changing back again. And Miguel de la Madrid, the president of Mexico at the time of George Bush, said to Kathy O'Brien, as she quotes in her book, that an, a reptilian extraterrestrial race interbred with the ancient Central American people because they needed to create bloodlines through which they could operate. Yes. And he said that these bloodlines were, in effect, today's world leaders. Does it fit with your knowledge, Credo, that the royal lines of the Chittahuli reptilian human interbreeding that become the demigods and the royal families, etc., that they have gone on uh, in Africa as well as the rest of the world to become the ruling uh, lines and the ruling people of these countries? Yes, many of them have. Said. In fact, some of Africa's most terrible warmongers men who have drenched large areas of Africa in unnecessary blood and suffering are directly descended from some of our greatest emperors of 600, 500, or even a thousand years ago. Just as the American presidents are. Say, I would like to tell you about a man called Jonas Savimbi. Jonas Savimbi is a descendant of some of the greatest Angola kings. In fact, the entire land called Angola was a breeding place of kingship in Africa. The, the word Ngola, Ngola means a king. And Angola means land of many kings. 
I must say, the way that the evidence that I'm uncovering uh, is going, and it's going there very fast, it, and it syncs so much with what you're saying, is that a race from the stars, a reptilian race, interbred with humanity, they created um, crossbreed bloodlines, which became the middlemen, the demigods, the royal kings and lines and uh, ruling power in the ancient uh, world, and through interbreeding has become the presidents, the uh, ruling uh, people in, at the top of the power structures of banking, of politics, of the military, um, of all areas of our lives, of, of, uh, of business, all of it. Um, is that the way that you have seen it yourself? Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Ike, I wish for one moment I could, co I could contradict you. But for the last 40 years, I have observed an extremely disconcerting phenomenon in South Africa and in other parts of Africa as well. And this is the phenomenon. You find a rising black leader, a real leader amongst men, a ferocious activist for the rights of his people. This man starts something, whether it's a revolution or whatever, he starts it. And you look at his ancestry, because in Africa we, we look very closely at a man's ancestry. And you find that this man is nothing. Although he is doing such great deeds, he is actually a, a, a descendant of very peasant people. Ow. And you are worried. And all of a sudden, this black man will come to a sudden violent end. And a person who is totally new will take his place. And when you look at the ancestors of these people, this man, you find that he, or even she, is a person of very, very ancient roy African royalty. Now, let me show you. There was this war in Rhodesia, and many people got killed there. And there was a very fierce and dedicated general. His name was Tongo Gara. And Tongo Gara fought in Rhodesia. And just when victory was won, Tongo Gara was killed in a terrific explosion. Somebody put a bomb thing in his car and killed him very badly. But wait, Tongo Gara had been a descendant of a blacksmith. His surname, Tongo Gara, means powerful hammer. Now, who replaced Tongo Gara? A man called Robert Mugabe. Now, you can't get more royal than that. Mugabe is descended from ancient Mashona kings, and what is more, he knows it. Always a leader is removed, and, a, and when the power really comes, a new leader descended from some faraway monarch or tribal chieftain two centuries or three centuries ago, comes on the scene. Again and again, there seems to be this particular force which elevates its descendants over ordinary human beings. I can give you hundreds of cases of this. Now, say, talk about a tradition of shape shifting. 
African kings, even now, and even ordinary tribal chieftains, especially in times of crisis, often spread the story through the land that they are able to change shape at will. There was a time when the South African government created the various Bantu homelands. And these homelands were ruled by those tribal chiefs who were agreeable to the apartheid system. Now, some of these chiefs were very unpopular with the people on the ground. And so, to build a charisma around themselves, these chiefs used to tell people that they are capable of changing shape at will. It was spoken about a certain African chief in the Transkai, who became one of the first rulers of one of several black homelands there, that one day his enemies were, were looking for him to assassinate him, and when they broke into his house, they found a huge lion sitting on the, on the floor, and this lion growled at them. And because of that story, because even today, word of mouth is a very powerful media of communication in black communities, all enemies of that particular chief left him well alone because they feared his shape-changing cha powers. The final question on this particular video, um, Credo, because we've got a lot more to say on others. Um, why is it that if the Chittahuli are all around us, which I certainly feel they are, um, and they're operating certain bloodlines, now some people see them shapeshift. That's absolutely without doubt. I mean, so many people I've met all over the world have seen it. Um, into reptiles and then back again, the George Bushes, the Henry Kissingers, uh, these key people. Um, why don't most people see it? First of all, sir, I have said to you, Mr. Ike, that we human beings have got a blind spot in our brains. And this is what the Chitauli and other alien nasty boys are exploiting. Look, sir, if we are a crowd and we are standing on a city street, we will see a man suddenly grow an extra arm. And many, many of us will see that, but will refuse to accept what we have seen. I have seen, sir, people going through severe trauma in train accidents, in car accidents, but they refuse to accept what they went through. I have seen women who have been raped several times, ferociously refusing to admit what, when, the, 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 what they underwent. I've seen it many times. And these alien creatures say, know our weakness. They know that very often we human beings tend to censor what we see. If, if you are an educated professor and you see a spook, your educated mind will refuse to accept what it is seen. You will reject it and throw it to the back banner of your brain and it will stay there. Hundreds of us see very strange things every day, but we refuse to accept what we see. Say, one of the things that a trainee Sangoma has got to, to learn, it is the ability to see. If I am standing here and looking at that bush over there, and I see something odd there. I must know what I've seen. But wait, sir. 
there is something else, something very, 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 very important, which I and many other thinkers in Africa have found. Mr. Ike, whenever you talk about such things, people call you paranoid. Mm -hmm. But no, you are really more sane than they really are. Say, there are certain vaccination things that are done to our children, which rob them of the ability of seeing spiritual entities. Believe me, I can prove this. In Zululand, we were sometimes called before the chief, before our chiefs, our Ingos, and we were told that there is a great smallpox coming to the land, and that all children must be vaccinated. Do you know that my mother's father, my grandfather, used to dodge that? He said that the white man's njov, the white man's vaccination, makes you blind. And if you are to look after my cattle, you must not go to the trading store to get your vaccination. But wait, the school inspectors used to come into the land and check each child for signs of vaccination or lack of it. Now, do you know what we used to do, Mr. David Ike? Our grandmothers used to give us great pain in order to save our spiritual eyes. They used to heat grains of maize, and then they would heat this grain of maize, and using two pieces, a piece of wood as tweezers, place it firmly against the skin of the child. So when the school inspector came, he saw these blisters, and assumed that the child had been vaccinated, but in fact it had not. And this was done to us many, many times. And I noticed that school children in mission schools who had been vaccinated for smallpox or for measles could not see spiritual entities at all. A a, 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 a Ndondo, that is a flying saucer, a spuputek, would fly through the sky at great speed and be seen by many men and women. But the child who had been vaccinated would see nothing. And I noticed this hundreds of times. Well, what you just said about the vaccines and their effect and shutting us down spiritually and multidimensionally uh, is fantastic given that um, no matter what your background, creed, culture, parents on every inch of the planet almost are being pressurized to have their children vaccinated more and more and more. And to summarize what you've been saying, um, and indeed it's so much in line with what I've come to the conclusion about as well, um, an extraterrestrial race, reptilian race, disconnected us from our true magnificent senses um, in the long, long ancient world. They've been manipulating us ever since, and the more that time has passed, the less we've realized this is going on. And now we're at a point where we are in a prison without bars, a massive prison, um, and we don't even know we're in prison. We don't even know who the jailers are. Indeed, when the jailers are exposed, people just laugh and ridicule and all that stuff. So we're in a, an unbelievable situation. And we're, we're in a jail we deny we're in. And there are jailers we deny exist. And we call it freedom. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, Mr. David, the reason, one of the reasons why I've joined forces with you is because I have serious reason to believe, and I will repeat these words until somebody shuts my mouth in death, 
I have serious reason to believe that on this planet things are coming to a head and our invisible jailers are going to fight tooth and nail to prevent this. Say, our people say that the blackest night often heralds the brightest dawn. The human being, captive as he is, slave as it is, is trying to fight back, say. And this is where the crunch is going to come. I believe that we are not far away from the bloodiest crunch in the world. And I will tell you, my visions tell me that we are going to be struck with the most terrible sword of all, the sword of money. Something is going to be done to money which will bring us all to the level of beggars. And do you know why, sir? Let me tell you. I used to work for big game hunters in Kenya. And one of them was an Italian gentleman. This Italian gentleman was such a, a powerful hunter, a white hunter. He used to shoot two bull elephants a day in Kenya. And he used to celebrate the shooting with a huge bottle. He called it a, ma a magnum of wine. I remember him pouring some of the wine onto the heads of the dead elephants. And then, one day we went with this man to the land now called Rwanda, which used to be called Rwanda Urundi. We went up the mountain and there, accompanied by pygmies, he shot a gorilla, a huge ngangi with silver fur all along its back. And the great beast died so bravely that this Italian hunter started weeping like a woman. He fired us, told us that the job is finished, and he never hunted again. Say, what I'm trying to tell you is this, that something inside us human beings is beginning to fight back against the Chitawuri. Something inside us human beings is beginning to say no. And the Chitauri are going to drag us all right into hell itself in order to, re to restore their power over us. Let me show you. Who would have thought in the 1950s during the time of the Cold War when everybody was expecting a bloody that world war between Stalinist Russia and the Western nations. When British, American, and even Russian nuclear bombs were exploding all over the place, who would have thought that a few decades after that, there would come a time when a group of young men and women the people of Greenpeace would sail their ship, the Greenpeace warrior, into a nuclear zone to prevent the French from testing one more atomic bomb. This tells us say, that something inside the human soul is fighting back. Forty years ago, it was once a very glamorous thing to to kill animals. Today, a big game hunter like my Italian friend would never dare show himself in some hotels. He would be spat at and he would be beaten up by people because the hero of yesterday, the Buana Banduki, the gun Buana of 40 years ago, is today a murderer. Now, things are coming to a crunch. 
40 years ago, nobody cared a damn about the environment. People did not even know that there existed such a thing as an environment or a food chain. Today, there are people who would rather lose their lives than not save a bug which is drowning in a river. A God is being born inside us, all of us, but herein lies the danger. We must be aware of the Chitawi. They are a real entities. They leave scars on human bodies. They kill people. They are murdering South Africa even as we are talking now. Every word you and I are speaking now is spoken too late, Mr. David Ike. AIDS is rampaging through our communities. And I have found a new disease in Botswana, which nobody is talking about even. It is 20 times more vicious than AIDS. It is called Ebola. Oh my God. And we, we must please be aware. Let nobody laugh when we talk about conspiracy theories. But there is one thing, sir, that I beg that you and others like you should discard una momento, as they say in South America. Stop calling the conspiracy a theory, sir. Mm. Theories do not kill people, Mr. David Ike. Theories do not murder innocent children. Theories do not put multiple murderers of Kabila's stripe into power in countries. Absolutely. Theories are just ideas floating in the air. This, the conspiracy is real. It is there and it kills. The staggeringly intelligent, the staggeringly wise and the staggeringly knowledgeable Kreda Mutwa. And his knowledge the world needs to know. Not only is Credo a man who has gathered this enormous knowledge together, he's a man with the courage and the foresight and the wisdom to know that the world needs to hear this, even though most of the world, particularly those who run the world, don't want anyone to hear this. But if we're going to be free, and we are, then we need to know all there is to know, and not just that which the few want us to think is the world when a very different world is unfolding all around us every day. In the next video, we're going to be taking the story on with Credo and showing how these reptilian bloodlines and this Chittahuli, this reptilian group, expanded their power across the world, took over Africa and other great continents, and today are the ruling elite that controls planet Earth. And by knowing that, and by knowing how it's done and how it works, we can take control and power back into our lives from those who have controlled us and this planet for thousands of years. It's a great time to be alive from Africa for now. Thank you and thanks for listening to A Remarkable Man.